Well, hello to everyone who's just joined us. I'm glad you're with us for this fourth program in our series in which we want to make sense out of the world which we are living in. So in this program today, we're unmasking the enemy of God and the enemy of humanity as well. Um, and uh, that's what we are looking at today. Whoops, sorry, went a bit far there. Um, moving on. So this is what we're dealing with tonight, folks. Um, this is the unveiling of the origin of evil and the origin of wrong. The origin of wrong. Lies, deception, war, suffering. We're dealing with the origin of that tonight. And uh, we realize there's a great mega story revealed in the writings of these ancient prophets that we've been looking at. Um, and they make sense of the reality of good and evil that we see competing in our world today. And we can all see it. It's as clear as crystal. This intrigues me. The battle between good and evil inspires every great writer and film producer. And you can see on the screen here all these various uh, films that have been made. And it's the battle between good and evil every single time. And uh, we all recognize it. Um, and it's very real. Now, what is the goal? This is the question. This battle between good and evil, what is the goal that this whole battle is over? The prize in this war is planet Earth. Now, that means there's much bigger than just your life or mine that's at stake here, now, although it impacts us all, and sometimes it impacts us very seriously, but it's definitely on. In the book of Revelation, the prophet John presents us with three evil powers. Now, we're going to unmask all these three powers uh, in the series that we are running. But tonight, we're just going to focus on this one, the first one on the left side of your screen, um, the seven-headed dragon. We find that we need to, do, to uh, identify who this is. This is the symbol of the being whom we plan to identify tonight. Um, so just to set your mind at rest, by the way, these other two powers, that one and the buffalo, um, they are great nations that are going to appear and have appeared. So just to set your mind at rest, uh, there's only one spiritual evil power, and that's on the left side of your screen. Now, as fantastic as it might sound, the first ever war was in the presence of God in heaven itself. And as you can see on the screen, this is what the prophet John wrote. War broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought. Now, that's that seven-headed dragon that you can see there. Michael, by the way, is another name for Jesus Christ. His angels fought with the dragon and the dragon had angels on his side. It sounds fantastic, folks, um, but these are the two protagonists, and we're looking at this tonight. The scripture goes on, the prophet John, the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan. So here we are. We know who we're talking about now. This great dragon is a symbol of Satan. Remember the word Satan means enemy. He deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Um, that's the bad news. And um, I want you to notice something important here. You'll always find the clues to the symbols used in these prophecies in the actual prophecy itself. If you look closely, you'll see the symbols, are guide, you'll get guidance there. And I've already mentioned that Daniel provides us with important keys to unlock the book of Revelation. And it's great prophecies. So keep that in mind. We're looking for the clues. We're not guessing here. Now, moving on, let's deal with this subject. How could war actually begin in heaven? How could this possibly happen? Well, this is talking about the original Star Wars. And it's rather interesting that the word star in the book of Revelation is the symbol for an angel. So the original Star Wars was indeed a battle between angels. And this was the first great battle between good and evil. Um, and we are going to have look, a close look at that tonight. First of all, who is the devil or Satan? He was the one, remember, leading his angels against Michael or Christ and his angels. Who is the devil or Satan? Now, there are two sides to the history of this dragon, this devil, Satan. There's an exalted side 
and there's a fallen soul. We're going to deal with the exalted side first. This is what the ancient prophet Ezekiel had to say about this. And he said this, you were the seal of perfection. Now, this is a very important point here. Um, God did not create a devil. He created a perfect being. It goes on to say, you were full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. Um, by the way, this is a reference to his ability to make music as he sang. He had pipes somehow in his voice box. Um, you can't imagine that, can you? He was a brilliant angel. Make no mistake about it. The, the, the scripture in Ezekiel, he goes on to say this, you were the anointed cherub who covers. Now, when you think of a cherub, folks, do not think of a chubby little boy with wings who has darts and, and that kind of thing and shoots you when you fall in love. Folks, a cherub was a mighty, a mighty being, powerful in strength. And we'll give you more information on that as we go in. So he was the anointed cherub who covers. That is, he was the leading cherub. I established you, God says. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. So he had a very privileged and exalted position in heaven. You were perfect in your ways. Lest you miss that point, that makes it very clear. You were perfect in your ways until iniquity or sin was found in you. So we're dealing with a perfect being here. Um, God didn't create a devil. He created a magnificent, perfect angel. So just to summarize, one, he was created by God at that point. Two, he was the anointed cherub. That is, he was a, God's leading angel and he was perfect. So we've got that clear, haven't we? Um, I want you to listen carefully to this point, people. He had the same power that we have. And that is, he had the freedom of choice and the ability to think for himself. God didn't want to make any robots. He made individuals, even angels, with power to choose and to love. As a matter of fact, without the power to choose, folks, if you were just programmed to love, you'd only be a robot. Yet to, to truly love, you must have the ability to choose. And Lucifer had that ability. His problem was this. Now we go into the dark side of Lucifer. It says your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. He became impressed with himself. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. Folks, pride and self-centeredness was the origin of his sin. Um, you know, he fell in love with himself. And you know the saying, folks, if you fall in love with yourself, you'll have no rivals. And that's what had happened to Lucifer. This is what Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, had to say about it. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer. And he actually gives us his name here for the first time. Son of the morning, that's what his name meant. How you are cut down to the ground. Um, his name was Lucifer. Um, I don't know anybody who's called their kids Lucifer. Do you? Um, yes, little Lucifers, they're firelighters. I've heard of those. But why don't people call their children Lucifer? Because it means son of the morning or day star. Um, which is a lovely name because we don't call our kids that name because everybody knows he's got a very dark side to him. Um, but there he was. He was the day star, a beautiful name for a brilliant angel. But, folks, he fell in love with himself. Remember we mentioned that. You have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. He had an eye problem, people, and it went on. I will sit also on the mount of the congregation on the farther sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. And then note this last one. I will be like the most high. Folks, he coveted the position of the creator himself. Um, the absurdity of that is clear, isn't it? Because the only one who can create is he who is the creator, the almighty. And Lucifer didn't obviously have that ability. But he still wanted that. Um, and it's a terrible thing. Now, so self-centeredness or ego is the root of all Satan's and Earth's problems. Um, and folks, think about it. Um, if we're not careful, it'll be the problem that we have as well. Notice that in the middle of sin is the word I, the letter I, sin. Well, what did Jesus say about the devil? He definitely described him on more than one occasion. 
on this particular occasion um, in that scripture on the screen, he was debating with his enemies, who eventually would put him to death, by the way. Uh, he was debating with them. And it says that Jesus knew Lucifer and knew where his animosities came from. And this is what Jesus actually said to his enemies. You are of your father, the devil, he said. The desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning. Not only that, he does not stand in the truth. There's no truth in him, it says. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resource for his lie and the father of it. Um, you know, we all value truthfulness, don't we? God hates lies and loves to see honest people, people of integrity. Lucifer, he said, was a liar and a murderer. Uh, he's not a nice person. By his own choices, Lucifer became Satan, the enemy. And we're quoting that scripture from Isaiah again. You have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I'll exalt my throne above the stars. That's the angels of God. I will be like the most high. Now, the question is, how did this happen in the very presence of God himself? Who, it, we, the prophets have said, was love incarnated. How does that happen? Folks, I want to make this very clear. To explain how sin originated in such an environment is to excuse it. There was no reason for it, no excuse for it. But we see the results of it in the world around us and even the battles we have in our own lives. Well, disaffected people rarely keep their disaffection to themselves. Lucifer was no exception to that. So he embarked on a whispering campaign. And his whispering campaign was very effective indeed. And amazingly, Lucifer deceived a third of the angels of heaven. Now, keep in mind, these were like Lucifer, perfect, sinless, beautiful, and holy. Um, but he was able to talk them around. He was an amazingly good, a good deceiver, folks. He was very good at what he did. Um, so he deceived a third of the angels. And they were cast out of heaven with him, as we'll see in a moment. The bad news is, of course, they came to planet Earth. Well, let's move on. The story in, in Revelation, as the prophet John told it, another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon, that one with the seven heads, remember? His tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. So this was the first Star Wars, literally a war of the stars, the angels. Now, I'm sure that this third of the angels who were deceived had no idea where this was going to head. But the consequences would be the same whether they understood where it was going or not. Would God have explained to them the issues? Absolutely. But they very quickly went too far. The downhill slope, people, is a very slippery one once you get started on it. So let's summarize Lucifer's fallen side. One, he was proud and self-centered. He fell in love with himself. He wanted to be like God. He was a liar and a murderer. He was a nasty piece of work. He was a deceiver. He was disloyal to God. That puts it mildly. So there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought and his angels. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So here's the full picture. Things came to a head. Lucifer made his dissatisfaction known to God. God appealed to him. Lucifer was obstinate, however, and would not back down from his, his opposition to God. Pride people. So the decision was made. He and his supporters were told to leave heaven. They didn't want to go. So there was war. I've had people ask, was this a real war? Um, folks, imagine this. Try and imagine this scene. <clears throat> uh, excuse me, Mr. Lucifer, would you be kind enough to leave now? No, sorry, you can't come back. Oh, sorry, of course, certainly. We'll be off then. Can you imagine that happening? I can't. Absolutely not. They left because they had to. No other reason. It was a terrible trauma for heaven. And uh, I've never been in a war zone, but I've certainly seen it on the screen, as probably you have, no doubt. And you can see something of the trauma that people face. 
Evan was in trauma, make no mistake about it. So they came here to earth. Now the question we need to ask is this, why didn't God destroy Satan before he could mess things up on earth? He'd made his position very clear. Why not get rid of him? Well, now God obviously could have done that, but there was more at stake here than is first apparent to us. God gave Satan time to demonstrate his true intentions because he wanted to ensure rebellion never reoccurred because the angels, the beings of, of the universe all have freedom of choice. And so it could have come back. Rebellion could have arisen the second time. So God is giving Satan time to demonstrate what he was going to really be like and where this was really going to end up. It's very interesting. Jesus told a parable one time and he said, a man sowed wheat in his paddock and um, well, unbeknownst to him, an enemy of his came at night and so put, sowed up all these weed seeds. And uh, as it started to grow, the servants of the landowner began to realize that there were weeds growing up. And they went to the landowner and they said, so what do we do? Shall we pull up all the weeds? And he said, no, you'll, un you'll unsettle all the, all the good wheat. He said, and it's on the screen, let both grow together until the harvest, the wheat and the weeds. And so that's what they did. And then the landowner said, an enemy has done this. And I thought, well, that is so apt, isn't it? Because that's exactly what has happened. So God gave Lucifer time to demonstrate the results of going his way rather than pulling up the weeds right away. An enemy has done this. Well, the, market, the focus has now moved from heaven to earth. The war is over in heaven. And now something is going to happen here. What will happen? Well, the earth is newly created. Amazingly, only two people here on earth. Lucifer sees the potential to make the earth his model of how he would conduct operations if he was in charge of the universe. So he's going to endeavor to do a takeover here from God of Adam and Eve. Now, I did mention this a time before, but I want to mention it again because people do sometimes struggle with the story of Adam and Eve. And I've often had people say, you don't really believe the story of Adam and Eve, do you? Um, and I simply ask, as I mentioned before, is the population of the world increasing or decreasing? Clearly, it's increasing. So if you extrapolate backwards, folks, you're going to get less and less people until eventually you get back to how many people? Just two. And remember, they've got to live in the same neighborhood. So yes, I most certainly do believe the prophet Moses who wrote this explanation of the entrance of sin into the world with Adam and Eve. So Lucifer's plan is to get them to side with him and the great struggle that he's having with God. This will prove his point, he thinks. Now, remember we read back in Revelation that some of the names of Lucifer are the devil and Satan and the serpent. And the snake was a medium or a certain uh, a, um, a disguise, if you like, a symbol of Satan. So what happened? Well, we've got to consider an important point here, actually, before we go into that. We already mentioned that humanity has been given the power of choice, freedom of choice. And folks, love gives you the right to say yes or no. Isn't that true? Uh, it works in human relationships. It worked with Adam and Eve as well. And God has given everyone the freedom to, cho to choose. We exercise that freedom all the time, don't we? Um, right down to the person you vote for, we exercise our ability to choose. Okay, so this is what God had told Adam and Eve. When he first created them, he said, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now, this is serious stuff, people. It was a simple test of their loyalties. A child could understand it. And uh, we'll see what happened. Well, seeing the happy couple there on the earth, enjoying the beautiful earth that God had made, Lucifer determined to take them over. He moved cautiously. He was smart enough to do that. The serpent was more cunning. Remember, this is the symbol of, the, of Lucifer. The serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, 
This is what he said. Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Said in a way that planted doubt in her mind. Now, some think that all this fuss over a piece of fruit makes no sense. But think carefully about this, my friends. The very genius of this test is that it was simple. It was intended to be simple. A child could understand it. The power of this test, of their loyalty, Adam and Eve's loyalty to God, was the simplicity of it. Oh, we need to keep that in mind. Um, well, what was her response? She said, of the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God has said, you will not eat of it or you will die. Remember, we read that a moment ago. Um, what did Lucifer say to that? He said, you will not surely die. Now, as he thought about it, it seemed to make sense to her. Um, this is the danger of toying with temptation, isn't it? It seemed to make sense to her. What was Lucifer actually saying to her? First of all, he says, God doesn't love you. He's, he's holding you back from a greater experience in life. Two, God's law is unimportant. It's just a good suggestion. And three, God isn't telling the truth. You won't die. So what was Eve going to do? Well, Lucifer was saying, trust me, it's always a worry when someone says that to you. And her response is simple. We know what she was thinking, which is rather interesting. You can follow her reasoning. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, like it didn't look like it was poisoned or anything, it was pleasant to the eyes, a tree desired to make one wise, um, because that's what the Lucifer had told her. So she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. With that simple act, humanity had joined the rebellion of Lucifer against God. And it's tragic, people. Absolutely tragic that she did this. And uh, by the way, she didn't die right away. She would have done except for one thing. Remember, she talked Adam into taking of the fruit too. He thought he'd throw his lot in with her. But as soon as they'd eaten this forbidden fruit, they were filled with guilt and anxiety because that's what, that's what sin does for you folks. Doing the wrong thing, we all know, it produces anxiety and fear, suffering and death. Um, we all know that. And uh, that's the heartache and the death that we see all around us, folks, is because of that one terrible step. So why doesn't God eliminate evil before it spread, not only to all the people on this planet, but all the other worlds as well? Why didn't God just destroy Adam and Eve? By the way, you'll notice it mentions other worlds on the screen here. The Hebrew prophets are quite clear on the existence of other worlds inhabited by intelligent beings who have never become part of Lucifer's, Lucifer's great rebellion against God. Don't think in terms of those hideous beings you see on Star Wars, people. They were beautiful and are beautiful beings. Uh, so sin has never gone into those, those worlds like our own. Um, so that's why Lucifer wanted to make this world a showcase of how he would be uh, conducting his rulership if he was in charge. Now, we haven't dealt with why God didn't destroy Adam and Eve. Why didn't he? For the same reason he didn't destroy Lucifer. Let sin bring forth its own fruits. Thus, remember, I said God had a lover plan. He loved humanity so much. He couldn't let them go. So he knew what he would do. He would trade his life for this. Now, the Hebrew prophets made it very clear that even before this earth was created, God had this plan in, prepared to deal with sin, which he knew would arise, which is something he was prepared to deal with. Um, so God was going to make a trade, his life for theirs. You can't imagine love like that, can you? It's incredible. However, suffering and evil, war and death were the unavoidable consequences. God didn't make these bad things happen. They are natural consequences. But God is watching over us to care for us if we want him to do so. And that's a very important point. Now, I thought I'd deal with this point at the moment, at this truck juncture. What protection do we have against Satan? Clearly, we, we're no match for the power. He's got supernatural powers. Not the powers of God, but the supernatural powers of an angel. 
Now, I want you to notice what the prophet says in James 4, verse 7. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The first step is submitting to God, saying, God, I want to give my life to you. He will give you the ability to resist the devil and the devil will flee. You call in the name of Jesus, friends, and I'm telling you, you are going to be very safe in a spiritual environment. There's power in Jesus' name. I want to tell you an experience I had some many years ago. When I was young, 20 years of age, 19 or 20, I was living in Papua New Guinea and I was living in a little donga, as they called it there, and something pretty terribly frightening happened to me. I woke in the middle of the night. I was half sitting up. I was frozen. I couldn't move. And right in front of me was this demon. Now, I don't know if you've ever had an experience like this. I won't labor this point because I don't have anyone going to bed scared stiff tonight. But um, I was there and this thing was about to reach out and touch me. I saw the hand coming towards me and I remembered, flashed into my mind, that years before, a friend had said to me, if you ever have a demon visit you, call on the name of Jesus. Now, I wasn't a converted Christian at this point in my life, um, but I remembered it came back into my mind. So I tried to call on the name of Jesus as this thing was reaching out towards me and I was frozen and couldn't do it. And suddenly I was freed up and I called out the name of Jesus and this thing just went zoom into the wall and was gone. Phew. That was, that was the most frightening experience I've ever had in my life, folks. I'm telling you about it because I want you to know and remember the power of Jesus' name. There's no power like it on earth. All right, let's move on. God gets the blame for the acts of the devil. If you want to know, you want to remember that um, when there's um, an earthquake or a cyclone and the insurance companies have to pay out, they call them acts of God. But they're not acts of God at all. These are the acts of the devil. Well, God made promises to Adam and Eve right after they rebelled right there in the Garden of Eden. And he, he made a promise. Interesting enough, he, he had a message for Satan, and there's a promise in this. And look what it says. God says, I will put enmity between you, Satan, and the woman, between your descendants, your seed, and her descendants. Then it, notice the capital H. He shall bruise your head, Satan's head, and you shall bruise his heel. That's really interesting. Notice it's his, not her. This is a reference to the Redeemer who would come. This was the first intimation to Adam and Eve that God was going to provide them with a champion to defend them and deliver them. Now, of course, we know about that champion now. Um, the Apostle John wrote, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. It was to be God's own son who would be their champion. There was nobody else who could do it. So God's son came. And he came to lead all those who would choose him back to paradise again. And a wonderful, wonderful thing to look forward to is paradise, as we've mentioned many times. When Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, and this was the signal, if you like, to Jesus about 30 years of age now to begin his public work and ministry. And John the Baptist did something very interesting. He introduced people to the world with these words. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now, what did he mean by that? Well, you're probably aware that for thousands of years, people have used animal sacrifices when they approached God. That goes back thousands of years. What was the point of the animal sacrifices? My dear friends, they were an, a teaching aid, if you like, to enable people to look forward to an age and a time when innocent blood would be shed for their sins. And so this was the teaching aid that God gave them. And Jesus came as the Lamb of God. Well, he brought heaven to earth. These are some of the things that Jesus did. He fed the hungry healed the sick, touched the lepers and cleansed them, befriended the outcasts, comforted the grieving. Folks, that back here, nobody's an outcast in God's sight. Remember that. He cast out demons. He raised the dead. He came to seek what was lost and to fix what was broken, to show what life on earth would have been like if humanity had remained faithful. 
And of course, he's going to restore it to that. And we've talked about that in our last program. Who really was Jesus? We know he, him as the son of God, but who actually was him? Now, I want you to read the scriptures on the screen. This is the great prophet John. And he wrote this. In the beginning was the word. Now, this is the name, if you like, of Jesus before he became Jesus of Nazareth, when he was still in heaven. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. Now, there's two points here. You've got God and the word because they are with each other. So there's two beings here. The word was God. He was God in the fullest sense of the word. All things were made through him. He was the creator. Without him, nothing was made that was made. Just in case you didn't get that point, he reiterates it. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word of God took on humanity. The great mystery of the ages, dear friends, is that the creator would join his own creation in order to save it and redeem it and be our champion. This is a very interesting scripture by the, the, the prophet Paul here is writing in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9. And uh, this is what he says. To make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, he goes on, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God. Remember I mentioned this plan of salvation was made well before, back in the eons of time, well before it was needed. And the last part is who created all things through Jesus Christ. So he's the creator. What is the mystery of the ages? The mystery of the ages is this, is this, that he who created us joined his own creation in order to redeem us. How could God love us so much? No wonder it was said of him that his name is Emmanuel. And Emmanuel means God with us. Just imagine walking the roads of Palestine with Jesus and hearing him speak. And I want to encourage you that through his spirit, he can be with you and me individually all the time. We'll talk more about that. So the creator became one part of his creation. By the way, not just for 33 years, but for all time. He became the person Jesus of Nazareth. If you like, he was a new person. Um, and he became a person, to a human being, and he's to remain that way forever. Yet he's not exactly the same as us. He would retain his divinity. He was the God man. He was just as much God as if he wasn't at all man and just as much man as if he wasn't at all God. Needless to say, this is a mystery to us human beings. Now, what Jesus did while he was on the earth was he took the full consequences of Adam and Eve's rebellion and ours upon himself. This is what the prophet Isaiah says about him. It says, he is despised and rejected by men, except for a handful. And it's still true today, just a handful of faithfully following him. Folks, we've got a wonderful privilege of being amongst that group. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken and smitten by God and afflicted. And look at this statement down here of Isaiah. God has laid on him the guilt and sins of every one of us. What an amazing thing. He took upon himself all our rebellion, all our sin, all the mistakes that you and I have ever made, all the stupid and dumb things we've done. He took them upon himself and took responsibility for them and took them off our shoulders. Folk, by doing this, he was demonstrating what love would do to break Satan's imperial and possessive grip on earth. He came to end human suffering and give us a hope that lasts forever because he would take responsibility for the sins and the woes of humanity. Please remember this. Earth and humanity on this earth were the prize that the struggle and the battle is now over. And the climax of the struggle between light and darkness was at the cross of Christ. That was the greatest battle. You know, Jesus could have come down from that cross because his enemies taunted him on the cross. Let him come down and we'll believe in him, they said. But, you know, Jesus' victory was in staying right where he was and dying for us. An amazing death that he might give us life. This is Hebrews 
in the book of Hebrews, a remarkable book. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, become human, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. His death was his victory because he carried our sins to the bitter end and died for us, folks. And he goes on to say, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. The older you get, the more real death becomes in your thinking. And uh, you begin to realize you can't avoid it. And we need a lifeline. Jesus is our lifeline. It's as simple as that. When Jesus died, the full price was paid for our sin and rebellion. The full price. And this is the scripture that's so relevant. He made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. He was the sinless one. He came to succeed where Adam had failed. Yet he was made to be sin for us. An ordinary man could die for their own sins, but not for the sins of another. Only the infinite one can provide an infinite atonement for all humanity. And he did that. So what have we been saying so far? Let's try and summarize here. First of all, the warning of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. In the day that you eat of it, you shall die. Nobody needs to be convinced of the reality of that. That's the warning. These are the consequences. The wages of sin is death, the prophet wrote. And this is the solution. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. Don't forget, don't, sorry, don't expect to fully understand this, folks. It's a mystery. The mystery of God's love and the mystery of God entering his own creation in order to save us. It's amazing. Here's another one. Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. This is why, my friends, you do not have to go on painful pilgrimages. You do not have to suffer in order to have salvation. Jesus suffered for you. He suffered, notice, once for sins. That's what it says. It only had to happen once, and he did it once. By doing that, Sin, Satan was exposed as a liar and a murderer. No question about it. Look at these amazing statements here. God didn't wait for us to deserve this. While we're, we're still uninterested in him, he still died for us. Look at that scripture. He demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Well before you even knew about it or wanted to have him do something for you, Dear friends, he died for you. It's incredible, isn't it, that he did this for us? Well, this is the reason God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. This was the motivation. God could not let the human race go, no matter what the cost to himself. That's hard to follow. All right, the practicalities of it all now. What will happen to the devil and his angels? Well, bad news for them, good news for us. Fire came down from heaven, from God out of heaven, and devoured them. This is Revelation talking about it. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. So there's a final judgment coming. And then the universe will be free again from sin and rebellion and suffering and sorrow and death. This is called God's strange act by the prophets, but it has to happen. If God doesn't deal with it, and bring it to a final conclusion, then the sufferings of this earth are going to continue for all time. It has to be dealt with. This is what God says through the great prophet Ezekiel. I turned you to ashes upon the earth. You have become a horror, and you shall be no more forever. I turned you to ashes upon the earth. Um, friends, Lucifer will become ashes. And the great conflict will be over at last, the great controversy between Jesus or Christ and Satan. I want you to notice he's going to be ashes. There'll be no ever burning hell to keep Satan before us. That is not what is going to happen at all. It's a lake of fire, does its job, and ashes are remained. As for humanity, dear friends, the cross assures us that we're going to have a new start in the earth made new and pure 
And we talked about that, didn't we, in program three. Jesus will return for his blood bought children. He's going to take us home to glory. So all those who accept his great sacrifice for them will be taken to heaven when Jesus comes. And he wants us all to be there. I love this promise that Jesus himself gave. I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Folks, we are heavenward bound. We really are. Now, this is the opportunity of a lifetime. I encourage you not to let this moment of time pass without a quiet yes to what Jesus offers you tonight. He calls us, where are you, my child? Are you coming? Will you respond? I'm going to pray for us all now, and I'd invite you to join in with me. Father in heaven, thank you so much for unveiling to us tonight the enemy that you have and that we have. We thank you that you sent Jesus, your son, the one who made us to join us and lead us out of this, this earth and its trials and its death and sorrow and its sin. And we want to thank you that we have the promise that this will one day be a thing of the past. Sin and Satan will be finally no more. Lord, I want to ask you to bless and remember the name of every person whose heart is open to you tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, the next program, folks, just very quickly, is program number five, The Ancient Prophets and Life After Death. We're going to explore what happens when you die. I think you're going to find this fascinating. So we enjoy and we look forward to enjoying your company again with us next week. In the meantime, God bless and keep you in his love tonight.